martyr to travel. We've been doing a series um, on the, the importance of small groups. Um, and so we've got, this is the last one. Um, this is our invitation. And I wanted to begin by just asking, is there a difference for you between Christianity and Christ? To, to professing versus living, to living it out on a regular basis. Um, and so I decided to kind of this time together, we're going to have people that are going to come up and share their experiences in small group, but I wanted to entitle this by calling it, The Proof is in the Pudding. And the idea of that, is, or the, the history of that, is the idea of, you can have a recipe, you can have all of the lingo, that, you can have the right words, you can have all of the ingredients, but the proof is in the product, the, the living it out, the day-to-day, -day, the, the practical, right? There's a difference between the theory and the practical. And so there's a difference between just showing up and saying, I'm a Christian, or filling out a, an application and checking the box that say, I am of the Christian faith. There's a difference between checking the box and living it out in a day-to-day -day experience. Small groups help you to work through the difficulties that you have, sometimes living this out. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to invite, uh, Jim is going to come up and he's going to invite some other people to talk about their practical experience living, with a small, living in a small group and the difference that it has made. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's... Uh, start off this time with a prayer. Almighty God, to you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pastor Steve has uh, spent three Sundays, uh, three messages, talking about this whole idea of soul care. And so I, I suspect from that we can deduce that he's pretty passionate about it. And so am I. I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm up here, probably also because no one else wanted to be up here. But. Um, Throughout those messages, he has cajoled us, he has uh, inspired us, motivated us, maybe irritated us, um, and, and, and invited us to be thinking about this, this soul care concept. I would like to just pose some questions here in, in, in that context. When was the last time someone asked you about the health of your soul? When was the last time you thought about, wrestled with, or listened to your soul? Is it starved for attention? Is it parched, desperate for something, anything meaningful? Is it frightened, hiding in a closet somewhere? Or is it dried like so many fallen leaves blown around by the whims of others? Now, Steve has uh, used Dr. Carl Jung uh, several times, and, and I want to um, highlight one of his quotes. It is wise to nourish the soul, otherwise you will breed dragons and devils in your heart. I can't recall if Steve used that before or not, but that just really uh, resonates with me and I think is descriptive of what we want to look at here this morning. So how do we nourish our souls? Well, uh, one of the right answers is soul care groups, okay? Um, and, and there's certainly other ways to nourish our souls. But that's the, the, the theme, the message that we're, we're looking at here this morning. And how does it protect us from dragons and, and devils and, and demons? I, I would suggest that our, our souls are this, this uh, entity that, that needs filling. And one way or the other, it will, it will get filled. 
And so the choice that we have is what we are going to, to fill it with. So this Sunday is, is, is the finale, as, as Steve indicated. And we're going to do something a little different, um, kind of continuing the theme, but with some individual, uh, personal kinds of perspectives to share with you. And I'm going to invite Quentin and uh, Cheryl just to, to join me up here on the, on the stage um, where they can share a little bit of their um, experiences and, and their um, impressions of, of Soul Care Group. First of all, um, I, I just I really appreciate you um, being up here. I'm I'm aware that uh, this is a stretch uh, in in some respects, and so uh, appreciate you um, being willing to uh, step out of your comfort zones and to um, to to share with us here. Um, and so I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. You can take it wherever you want. Um, but but to, to, to start with here, um, what, what was your initial response or, or kind of reaction when you were uh, in, invited uh, to, to uh, consider a soul care group? My initial reaction was, um, Jim, well, if I could start all over again. Jim called me and asked me if I'd be interested in being in a soul care group and I immediately said yes. Pastor Steve had been speaking about these soul care groups, these small groups for a long time, and so I had time to think about it, and it was something that I wanted to do and participate in. Okay, I was, I was a little more reluctant, you know. I, I, got, asked, I got asked, and um, my first thoughts were, do we have the time? You know, I was working a lot, and um, the kids are in sports, so we're kind of like, where are we going to find the time? Um, you know, I was concerned if I knew anyone else, was I going to fit in? Um, and then my, another big thought was, how could I, what value could I add to this group? You know, I've never really thought about the condition of my soul or, you know, how my soul is, you know. So I, I was concerned if the value was even there. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, given that kind of initial uh, startup, um, how, how has Soul Care Group been meaningful in your life? How has it impacted you? Uh, the meaningful part is it has grown me, it has, it has helped my relationship with God to grow deeper. And also, the way it impacts me, that I can see how my faith has grown from just experiencing what we do in Soul Care Group. And how, how it happens, I think, is um, it's not all about me anymore. It's about us. We are, we are a group. We, um, we bring to the table uh, things, and we take away things. We share with each other. Um, get different perspectives on things that we're going through or experiencing. And we practice faith over fear mm. continuously. Mm. And we are accountable for each other. So that was a great explanation. Mine, <laughs> mine, uh, so I was like, Pastor Steve has been talking about the last couple of weeks, my faith just kind of seemed like I was drifting, you know, I look back and I'm kind of in the same spot, I don't have any um, clear, clear direction, so um, I decided I'd give it a try, um, and it has enforced a quiet time each week. You know, you, you put it in your schedule, you know it's going to be there, so if your week's chaotic, um, you, you know you at least have some, an hour or two to, to dedicate. Um, it's, I've been praying more, I've been reading scripture more, um, and I actually have a, um, each week I actually find myself looking on how God is working in my life mm -hmm. and, and looking for, 
for something that I can bring back to the group and share with others. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And so fi finally, um, uh, as you look out here on, on the audience, um, what, what would you say to them in regards to kind of selling or promoting the, this idea? Soul Care Group is exactly that. Um, it gets you in a place that you can actually ask yourself, how is my soul? How do I choose to look at others? And then how do I choose to look at myself? Yeah, I find it's a, it's a great way to, um, if you're struggling with an issue, you know, you've got a, a different array of people from the church who have probably uh, been through the same things that you might be going through. They have different outlooks on kind of what, you know, everyone has a different opinion on the same situation. So it just brings different perspectives and um, different options on how to get through your struggles. Um, and then it's, it's accountability and and encouragement so you don't find yourself just drifting around you you have um, people a group of people who you know are going to be um, asking how your soul is so you, it, it just gives you that accountability to to put in the time and and look for things throughout your week and it's a great way to get to know your peers on a deeper level um. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your uh, stepping out of your comfort zones and, uh, and sharing this with us here. So thank you. At, at the risk of sounding paternalistic and, and, and creepy, um, I, I, I just want to say that uh, it's, it's really gratifying for me to see the, 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 the growth of, of, of these people. And I think it's a direct um, function, result of, of, of soul care groups. And so um, that's why I, I, I wanted you to hear from them because that's, that's where, the, where the core, where the action is. So, so just a bit about, about me here. Uh, initially, for me, I was, I was kind of skeptical about soul care groups, too. Um, like, you know, I've heard that term, but like, what, what is it? And for me, you know, it's not, it wasn't an issue of, of uh, the group kind of dynamic. I've, I've been doing group therapy for 35 plus years, and it's a real comfortable kind of modality for me, uh, uh, and so that really wasn't the issue. It was, it was the soul care, like, like what, what is that? What, 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 are, what are we going to be doing? What's going to be required of me? Um, and so given it was new and different, um, I, I had some reservations, and I suspect that one of my reservations, some of my reluctance, was a, a concern about maybe being kind of exposed, like like not looking good, and um, and and so I want to I want to look at that concept of looking good. I grew up in a family where that was a fairly important thing, looking good. Um, uh, following the rules, doing the right thing, playing by the rules. And so for me, this was um, kind of a, 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 an adjustment, kind of a, a, a shift. And, you know, I'm, I'm standing up here right now conscious of, uh, you know, not wanting to make a fool of myself, okay? And so that, that concern about looking good, I mean, I... I earned my shirt this morning, and I'm thinking, you know, Michael's sitting down there. You probably don't even know what an iron is. So, um, <laughs> and, and so looking good. 
<clears throat> it's, a, it's a growth area for me. It's this shift from kind of looking good to trying to reflect the goodness of God. That is, it's not about me. It's about, it's about God. Now, maybe all of you or most of you have a, you know, a pretty highly developed uh, degree of competency in this area. That is, it's not maybe a really uh, an issue for you. Um, but I would suspect that John Wesley, back there in the 1700s, um, was concerned about that issue with his parishioners. And, and, and I would contend that, that that might have been one of the reasons or some of the impetus for his kind of conceiving of this soul care concept as a place to get down and get dirty, to maybe even get a little bit muddy. Um, and, and, and so the question might be asked, um, so why would I want to get down and dirty? Why, why would I want to get muddy when I can just go to Sunday morning worship service and my clothes can stay clean and pressed and I don't have to worry about getting dirty. So why would I want to get messy when I can just keep clean? So the, the, the profound irony here is that each one of us is messy and dirty from time to time in our Christian walk. It's, it's something that characterizes every single one of us. And so why is it so difficult for us to, um, to, to reveal our messiness when it characterizes every single one of us? Frankly, you know, it is just countercultural. As, as everything about our culture screams looking good. Facebook, you know, perfection. Better homes and gardens. Uh, beautiful, perfect kinds of images. We typically don't post pictures on Facebook of our car in the ditch after we ran it off the road, okay? It just, just doesn't happen. And so, looking good. Yesterday, in, in, in our soul care group, we, we just came up with two words that start with S that I think characterize kind of the antithesis of that. And, and that is struggles and stumbles. Struggles and stumbles. Um, and, and, and that's what the challenge, I think, is for, for all of us to, to expose that. To, to reveal that. And so, you know, the reality is if, that, if looking good is, is really important to you, then soul care groups might be a little intimidating. But I'm a living and breathing example of someone like that, and I'm, I'm living to tell you about it, okay? And so, and so that's the, the good news. The, the, the reality also is that if... Um, if, if we just continue with the looking good, um, that'll keep us in our comfort zone. And so that's the good news. But it'll also keep us stuck. And, and, and that's the bad news. And so <clears throat> the only way we really grow, I would contend, is by stepping out, taking risks, and, and doing the... the um, unfamiliar and the uncomfortable. So, getting real. Um, in, in, in some respects, that's, that's kind of the polar opposite of looking good. You know, and what do I mean by that? I would suggest that, that getting real is bringing together what is going on in our lives, in our heads, in our guts, in our souls, 
with what we reveal. Bringing those two disparate parts of us together. And that, that's, that's challenging, you know? Uh, what, what, what typically happens when, you know, we meet someone or uh, encounter someone and they ask us how we are, the, the, the instinctive response is, um, I'm doing fine, okay, without even thinking, okay? And so getting real, bringing those two parts together. So why is that important? Getting real is incredibly satisfying. And, you know, I think uh, Quentin and Cheryl both uh, alluded to that as they talked about their, their experiences. As we share our struggles, our, our blind spots, our vulnerabilities, <clears throat> that, that just kind of uh, brings this sense of congruity and integrity and, and peace uh, into our lives. And it's a, it's a bonding experience. Again, I think Quentin and, and, and Cheryl uh, suggested this, this, this bonding experience where um, I share something uh, of my struggles and someone else in the group kind of identifies with that. And then they start talking about some of their struggles and it just kind of, of grows. And, and that's the whole essence of, of uh, soul care groups. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Linda to, um, to, to join me up here. We've been um, working on this a, a, a bit together, and uh, Linda has some um, things that she would like to share. Good morning. Let me join the parade of those of you who have walked up here feeling nervous this morning. My, in part, my issue is that in my part, my issue is that you all want to go home about now, and I haven't even started. So if you would bear with me just a few minutes, I do have some things that I've prepared to say um, that I do think are, are, are important for soul care. And, and in case you don't know, um, I, have been, I have been asked to, uh, or I've volunteered to, I agreed to become the soul care group uh, coordinator. Some of you that were here a few months ago and saw me up here talking on behalf of missions, I want to assure you this is not a takeover. Um, in fact, this is a great opportunity for me to say that Cheryl Marshall, who you heard speaking just a few minutes ago, has agreed to assume the leadership of the uh, missions committee. And I am so excited for some of the things that missions is getting into, I, new ideas that are coming up, and uh, many, many opportunities for anyone who wants to, to be involved in, in, in outreach. In fact, a plug for the sign-up sheets on the table back there. Uh, connecting at Christmas. These are some of the things that Mission, along with uh, Kristen and the children, and a number of us got together to brainstorm, so please sign up. Um, so why did I jump at the opportunity to be the soul care coordinator? What was the nudge or the calling that I felt to do this? Um, I'm always looking for ways to better recognize how God is talking to me and what God is saying to me in my life. Always. Um, one of the most clear ways, though, though that I feel um, that I have seen God working in my life is when I follow the Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs backwards to previous times in my life. And when I look back and follow those crumbs, I sometimes feel like, oh, you know, that's why I'm in the situation I'm in now. God prepared me for this because of that and that. And in fact, um, not long after we were married, which is a long time ago, a friend gave Jim and I a book called Care of the Soul. What, I was startled. Care of the Soul? I mean, I had grown up in a Christian family, and I certainly was uh, trained to be aware of where my soul was going after I died, for sure. But the idea that your soul needed care was just really curious to me. I thumbed through the book, um, the idea was planted, but I never followed through on it. Prior to that, just after college, a friend of mine had introduced me to the idea of spiritual disciplines. I was a disciplined student, good grades were important to me. I knew about discipline, but the idea of linking prayer, Bible reading with discipline was again a foreign idea to me. 
Um, again, the idea was planted, but I did nothing to really pursue that. I didn't, wasn't curious enough. So those of you that heard Steve's teaching last week saw the, saw the, heard the example and the metaphor of kicking the can down the road. I um, don't know who all heard that. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that in relation to this topic. Um, the big risk, I think Steve was right, the big risk in kicking the can down the road is you do not know what shape the can will be in when you catch up with it. It reminds me, in fact, of a story that I heard long ago about a little eight or nine year old who, little boy, was looking for money during the summer and he volunteered to water his neighbor's beautiful rose bushes all, uh, while she was gone for 10 days. Well, the first seven days he told himself, oh, I got plenty of time. Well, day eight he arrives and you can imagine what shape the roses look in. This looked in, this was the middle of summer. Um, all of his efforts to resurrect the roses including overwatering them, could not render the roses healthy by the time she got back. From my vantage point at my age, I firmly believe that time is something we don't get back. I spend the time that I spend, like Quentin, uh, calling for my time I spend caring for my soul quiet time. And if it's okay with you, even though we're going late, I would like to undo some reading and I do praying, and I'd like to just share a couple ideas that have popped up to me during my quiet time that I think uh, pertain to the conversation today. The first one is uh, actually a question. The author that I read used the uh, question, um, what are the ways we hide from God? What are the ways I hide from God? And this stems from the story of Adam and Eve but I think it has lots of applicability and uh, for other, other things too. I am wondering um, if our reluctance to do our own soul care, my reluctance to do my quiet time, reluctance to be involved in soul care group um, is a way of trying to hide from God. And I think the label that has attached to it is, I'm too busy, I don't have time, just a question. The second idea relates to a quote by a woman named Wendy Wright, don't know her, but I love what she said when she said, to be a Christian doesn't mean knowing all the answers. We've heard that many times throughout our life. But the second part of the quote, um, what being a Christian means is being willing to live in the part of yourself where the questions are born. What part of yourself are your faith questions born? What if instead of working hard to appear to have all the answers to look good, we expose that mushy, unstable, kind of gray spot inside of ourselves where our honest struggles and questions live, and we expose those to a group of fellow believers? Melanie sang this morning, there are questions without answers and flames that never die. I love that. I think that's what we're talking about, those questions that never die. Third idea comes from an author who, who, who compares the skeleton of doctrine with the beating heart of God made tangible in Jesus. And this is what Steve was talking about when he talked about what is Christianity versus what is encountering Christ. And if you'll bear with me just a second here, the skeleton of doctrine, which of course is the beliefs we've been taught, versus the um, beating heart of Christ. I'm really old, but I went to many science classes growing up where you walked into the classroom, didn't matter what science class it was, and there was a skeleton hanging on a hook, maybe by the teacher's desk. Nobody's nodding, so maybe this is all virtual now, but this was a part of our science, okay? The point is, um, what if in exploring the mystery of being a human, we stopped with the skeleton? never bothered to study the intricacies of the kidney, the ebb and flow of the lungs, the enormous capacity of our brains, or the warm mystery of the beating heart. What if we thought to be humans being a skeleton? I think soul care helps us look beneath what we say we believe and helps us line up those beliefs 
with the places in our life where we wonder, goof up, hurt, and if, we, if you allow, where we fear. Okay, we're out of time, so we're gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip that part. So I just wanna do quickly what soul care is and what it's not. It is not a couples group, okay? It's wonderful if both partners in a relationship wanna come, but it's not a couples group. Please don't let your partner, whoever they are, your partner's level of readiness determine yours. It is not a drop-in group. I feel like, almost feel the strongest about this besides the concept of it. It's not a drop-in group. Um, if people commit to come, coming, and then one time someone doesn't come, especially without calling, it is not the same group. It is not the same group. Everybody's attendance there makes it the group that it is. Um, it's a place where surprises happen. Um, Quentin or Cheryl, one of you talked about how, how um, the mystery of when you're involved in this group and two people at different places in time in different, pla different times of the week had a very similar bump in with God and they share it. Or somebody's experience with God becomes the backdrop for someone else's experience the next week. You can't plan those things. Um, okay, in closing, are soul care groups the only way you can grow in faith? Of course not. Are they the only way to be faithful? Of course not. Do you get a special pew at church if you join up? Don't think so. Um, but in most cases, they can offer spiritual growth, a less lonely and more meaningful way to ask hard questions, and a way to be known and loved by the church family, those who you agree to join, join in with. We call it um, watching over each other in love. Logistically, I am going to be the one uh, collecting the soul care group, uh, the cards that you sign up, please sign up. I would like to individually, or if it's a couple, talk to you before we make an assignment to the group just to coordinate with the group leaders about what kind of room they have in the groups and you know where the group is going. So thank you for your patience. Oh, I forgot the prayer, excuse me. May you draw deep from the wells of the holy and have the protection and guidance of God on every path. Amen. Harder to travel in groups.